Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm uh, Marcy Albaher from Encore.org, and I see that Mark Friedman, our guest of honor, is here. He's to my right on the screen that I'm looking at, maybe uh, to your left, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, I just want to also acknowledge my colleague, Duncan Magidson, who's in the background making all the magic happen here. So I'm really excited to be interviewing Mark today about how to live forever, his new book. He's been all over the country talking about this uh, book. He was profiled in the New York Times yesterday. Um, I hope you all saw Jane Brody's column. If not, we might be able to include a link in the follow-up email. And we're just gonna do an informal conversation um, about this book, and, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions from all of you. So uh, first, I just wanna give a little introduction. I'm guessing that most of you, if you're on this webinar, know who Mark is. Um, if you don't, Mark is a serial social entrepreneur. He's the founder, president, and CEO of Encore.org. Uh, we just had our 20th anniversary uh, last year. And Mark has really been one of the leading innovators in the field of aging and inter intergenerational connection um, for really his entire career. And this book is quite personal. It really tells the story of Mark's own journey um, in, in the work, as well as uh, it's a really guide about how to live in this way that we around here call Gen to Gen, and you'll hear more about that in a minute. I met Mark um, probably a little more than 10 years ago, in uh, 2000, oh, more than 10, 10 years ago, because it was two books ago in 2000. Seven, I believe, Mark's book Encore came out. I was then writing for the New York Times and I interviewed Mark for that book and wrote a piece about that book and uh, caught the Encore bug and uh, just, I don't know, maybe a couple of years later came to work with the organization and have been here ever since uh, leading our communications efforts. So um, now I'm gonna just uh, engage Mark and then all of you. So Mark, I just wanna start with uh, kind of the most obvious question. The title, How to Live Forever. Uh, people might think you're hawking longevity drugs, so can you explain? <laughs> yes, well, first of all, thanks, Marcy, for that lovely introduction. And, and uh, it seems overdue and appropriate for us to be having this conversation since this conver conversations amongst us were so critical in, in developing the ideas in the book. And I, I'm very grateful for all the help all along the way. And, um, and yes, you know, it has a, a very uh, dramatic, some might say overblown <laughs> title. It, it actually, uh, the title came from uh, our good friend at Encore, uh, Eric Liu, who is another serial social entrepreneur. And I, I think I had come up with some milquitoastal title and he said, no, 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 you gotta, you gotta be more, more uh, dramatic than that. Something that will grab people by the lapels. And, but as you say, it's, it's metaphorical. It's not about uh, about living forever in a in a uh, literal biological sense, although in, in many ways the origin of the book came out of um, a real concern and disquiet about how much we're focusing as a society on on uh, literally living longer and longer. I, I got a fellowship uh, from the Packard Foundation to write the book, and so I spent a lot of time commuting down to Silicon Valley, and it seemed invariably on my way back from trips to the Packard Foundation, I'd get stuck in front of a billboard <laughs> on the way home uh, for hours on end, it seemed, uh, from Prudential, the life insurance company, uh, annuity company, and, and the billboard proclaimed that the first person to live to 150 had already been born. And that the purpose of the billboard was not to celebrate longevity, it was to scare the hell out of people about the prospect of 85 year retirements. But I also knew that from um, you know where I'd started the journey in Silicon Valley, uh, a lot of very uh, influential technologists were, were literally working on making 150 kind of the starting point. Uh, Google has a big partnership with AbbVie, the drug company called Calico, which is focused on life extension. Larry Ellison, the Oracle founder, uh, notoriously told one media outlet that he'd never thought much of death, uh, to which Michael Kinsley, the uh, founder of Slate, responded wonderfully. You know, it doesn't really matter what Larry Ellison thinks of death. What's much more important is what death thinks of Larry Ellison. <laughs> But the basic problem is that all of these 
people. And apparently in the past year, $45 billion were spent on radical life extension. It, it all goes back to a problem that JFK diagnosed in the early 1960s. He said we'd added years to life. Now it was time to add life to those years. And since that time, we've added an average of two months already to the American lifespan, not even counting the 150 or, or beyond. Um, but we haven't been doing nearly so well at thinking about what those years and months and decades are, are all about. In fact, one person described them as a, a season in search of a purpose. And so a lot of what this book looked at was, was adding life to, to those years, but in a way that not only enriched our lives as people in the second half of, of life, but um, the ongoing flow of generations. Right, so that gets me to, you know, is this book, is, is your target audience only people in the second half of life, or do you think there's something here for everyone? Because, I, I mean, I, I don't think this book is, is, you have written other books that I think were really kind of targeting that 50 plus market, and I feel like this book is kind of meant for everyone. What's, yeah. what's the feeling you're getting? Yeah, well, you know, I, I mean, I think the backdrop for the book um, is this notion that that there's some brewing generational war between kids and canes and this gray wave of greedy geezers will, will soon be or maybe already has taken uh, the next generation to the cleaners. In fact, as I was writing the book, uh, Stanley Druckenmiller, the noted philanthropist and Jeffrey Canada, one of the most significant innovators and improving the lives of kids uh, headed out on a campus tour uh, not to figure out where to send their kids to college but to tell young people that um, not only was there going to be a generational war that we'd already had it and that older people the villains had um, had bankrupt their prospects and they they described themselves in a New York Times column as trying to save a few scraps from the table and I you know I have great admiration for Stanley Druckenmiller and, and certainly for Jeff Canada, but I feel like that that perspective is is pernicious, um, and it and it it very much contributes to this sense of our a fractious society where every every narrowly self interested group is at each other's throats. But in fact, if you switch the lens from the kinds of things that Canada and Druckenmiller were talking about, particularly fiscal issues, and shift to a deeper developmental historical perspective, you, you realize something very different, which is that um, this idea of older and younger people being at odds is a very recent construct. Um, but in fact, since the beginning of time, older people and younger people have, um, have actually been very close, have contributed to each other's well-being. In fact, when, when you look even more deeply, you get a sense that uh, rather than being at odds, the needs and the assets of the generations fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, that older people are really built for the role of connecting with and contributing to the next generation, and young people desperately need that kind of support. So, Mark, why don't you talk a little bit about how you got into this work? I mean, this book tells a very personal story of your own journey to mm -hmm becoming a social entrepreneur and digging into these very issues. When you were a really young man, you got interested in older people. How, how did that happen? Well, I, I've really got two uh, intersecting journeys. Um, and this book was a chance to look back at, at how they, they were interwoven. The professional journey is really something I spent the first 15 years of my working life focused on trying to find new sources of support for young people. And uh, in all the conversations I'd had with young people in schools and social programs, one of the major themes that came across is, is the power of a, a caring adult. And at the same time, social scientists were coming to similar conclusions. The most significant long-term study of young people growing up in poverty done by a psychologist at the University of California, Emmy Werner, found that the presence of a caring adult was the most important factor in kids making it against the odds. And in fact, Yuri Bronfenbrenner, the great uh, child psychologist, one of the co-founders of the Head Start program, encapsulated all of that research uh, into one line of brilliant wisdom. He said, what every child needs is at least one adult who's irrationally crazy about them. Mm -hmm. and 
Um, I was involved with others in, in the first study that was done of the Big Brother, Big Sister program, which showed that that was true, that Bronfenbrenner was right, and that the power of this kind of, of support for young people could extend beyond those young people who were so charismatic that they could find adults to, to mentor them on their own. And, and Big Brothers, Big Sisters was having really remarkable uh, impact on kids, but they had a, a waiting list that was half the size of the program, and it raised this fundamental question, if this kind of support matters so much, where are the human beings to provide it? And they were recruiting mostly people who were in their 30s, 40s, 20s, who had kids of their own and rarely had enough time to spend with somebody else's kid. 10 to 12 hours a month was the magic number for Big Brothers Big Sisters. So where were the people who had the time and the uh, availability and the numbers to, to play this role? And even then, you know, long before we started hearing about the demographic revolution and the longevity gains and, and the aging of American society, it, it seemed that, that the older population was a really promising group. And I think I was particularly attuned to that because um, throughout my life, really, I've had a whole series of older people who've taken me under wing and just made an enormous difference um, in my life, certainly my happiness, and instilled this this kind of fundamental inchoate understanding that that the connection between older and younger people could be mutually beneficial in spectacular ways. So, um, so it's kind of obvious now, I think, how this really relates uh, to the gen to gen work that Ankur is so deeply involved in right now. Can you talk a little bit about why why we created gen to gen and and what we're trying to accomplish there? You know, I, th there have been so many powerful examples of, of this kind of work, um, and in the book I talked about them, but, but we need to, to bring older and younger people together at a scale commensurate with uh, opportunity, with the need. We talk about these, these demographics, 10,000 people a day turning 60, um, but, and in fact, this year, 2019, is a Rubicon for American society, you know, where countries always thought of ourselves as, as young, you know, uh, we, we glorify youth, um, we broke off from the old world, uh, but in fact, we are now uh, a more old than young society in 2019. It, it's the first year that this country has more people over 60 than under 18. And so that's a, a, you know, a really big transition and it's not a temporary blip, it's actually a permanent change. And so we need to figure out how to make the, the most of these new demographics. And there's an incredible uh, uh, ferment of local programs that are, are showing us the way, but uh, I think we need to try to, to bring that those efforts together and the efforts of individuals in a way that that really amounts to a movement. So Generation to Generation, Gen to Gen campaign started out with a call to a million older people to stand up and show up for, for kids uh, and to work with young people to bring about lasting social change, to create a future that young people uh, will want to be part of and that older people will, will be proud of as a as a legacy. And so uh, it, it, it also, I think, in many ways um, is inspired by one of the great efforts that's happening in the UK, uh, Now Teach, which Lucy Kellaway, a, a renowned journalist at the Financial Times, decided to launch when she was 58 after being so inspired by her daughter who was in Teach First, the British equivalent of Teach for America, and thinking that she wanted to do something like that. So she uh, she announced uh, a couple of years ago in her column that, that a year uh, ahead she would be not writing columns for the Financial Times but in front of a, a low-income classroom in London teaching math. Um, and then she did something that nobody here in the U.S. has done. Um, she challenged her readers of a certain age to quit their jobs and to join her. And to her own amazement, a thousand people came forward. They originally had 20 slots or 50 applicants for each of those slots. And I think with, with Gen to Gen, we're trying to do something similar, which is to, to not only uh, make the case for what bringing the generations together can be, but to challenge older people to come forward to uh, 
to support the next generation to work together with young people um, and to do it in a way which, uh, which will help us navigate this more old than young society that's already washing over us. Great. So, you know, one of the big themes of the bookmark is um, what you call age segregation. And in fact, you called it age apartheid in an article uh, a couple of years ago. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and how we got here? Yeah, you know, I, I, I feel like um, uh, sometimes when, one of our first programs at, at Encore, as you know, uh, was Experience Corps, which brings together older people and children in low income schools, to help them read by grade three. And it's a great program now run by AARP, um, has wonderful research that shows the program works. But it raises a question in many ways, um, why doesn't this just happen naturally? You, you know, there's always gonna be a place for efforts like Experience Corps, but shouldn't much more of this connection between older and younger people who are developmentally built for each other happen? And so um, um, I, I got curious about why it doesn't happen on, on every block and every school and in, in the workplace uh, nearly so much as we would want. And, and the answer is that um, it's because we thwarted it from happening. And in fact, for all of our history as a country up until the 20th century, and really for most societies in Asia, in, in Europe, uh, in elsewhere, um, uh, young and old um, were, were intertwined um, from birth to, to death. Uh, we were the most age-integrated society in the world at the beginning of the 20th century. People worked together on farms, mm -hmm. uh, in multi-generational households. There was, uh, even in one-room schoolhouses, you'd have 40-year-olds and five-year-olds learning side by side. People had no consciousness of age. If you were to ask me what age I was in the 19th century, or, or me to ask you, it, uh, we wouldn't have any idea. Birthdays weren't celebrated. Uh, it would be like asking somebody their blood type today. You'd never even think to do it. The birthday song wasn't even invented until 1934 when the greeting card industry <laughs> got into the game. Um, so we were, you know, we were not age conscious. We were age integrated. Um, and that was um, like the oxygen in the air. And then beginning in the, in the early part of the 20th century with the best intentions in mind, we started reshuffling the deck of society so that young people got shunted into educational institutions, middle people into the workplace, and older people into a set of institutions like nursing homes and retirement communities and, and senior centers and the Twains stopped meeting. And there were efficiencies to be sure in doing things that way, but yeah, we ended up with a society that one observer described as a grievous wound that we'd inflicted upon ourselves. The seeds of ageism, of loneliness, of the kind of conflict we were talking about earlier, you know, as probably many of the uh, participants in the webinar know that the former Surgeon General Vivek Murthy two years ago wrote an article in Harvard Business Review arguing that the single greatest public health issue in America today is loneliness, equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And it turns out new research shows uh, and confirms that the two loneliest groups in society are older people and younger people. So I think it's time that we um, we mount something that uh, I, I love the title of one of Michael Lewis's recent books, The Undoing Project, uh, which is a book about Daniel Kahneman. <laughs> I think we need an undoing project. We created this highly segregated society that's brought with it a whole set of, of ills. And we need to begin uh, to, to unwind that. We, we rerouted re the river of life, um, and now we need to re return it to its natural course. Yeah, so that gets me to, you spent a lot of the last few years traveling the world and, and this country trying to find innovative models that are doing that, that are actually undoing this age segregation. Can you share one or two of your favorites? Well, I took now teach in the UK is 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 one of those examples, and I'm I'm pleased to announce that um, after uh, being a great admirer of now teach and accosting anyone who will listen to talk about how great a program it is, they've become a partner of Encore.org. We've launched the Encore Fellows Program, uh, something that that started here in the United States and has about 2,000 Encore Fellows uh, to date. 
uh, in the UK and the very first organization which is using the, the talent of fellows in the UK is, is now Teach. Um, but I, I feel like they're a great example, like I was saying before, of, of um, somebody in the, in the second half of life who's not only willing to do this work, but to come forward and challenge their peers to, to do so as well and issue a real call to action, kind of in Pied Piper-like fashion. But the other uh, end of the spectrum is happening in, in Singapore, a Singapore country of, of just 4 million people that's investing uh, 3 billion Singaporean dollars, so something like 2.1 US dollars in a major effort to um, to integrate older people into every facet, really reintegrate older people into every facet of society. They've said that they want to create a kampong for all ages, kampong being the Malay word for village, built around the notion of intergenerational harmony. And it's enormously pragmatic, um, as you would expect in a country that's that's renowned for its its planning uh, and efficiency, and they've done things like uh, mandated that every new preschool that's built should be built in conjunction with a senior center co-located with the senior center. All of the new housing developments in a country where the government owns all the land are uh, built around the idea of bringing the generations into proximity. They're creating something they're calling three gen flats. They've launched a massive volunteer corps of older adults, much of the work focused on helping young people thrive. So really in every every facet of of the work, there's an attempt to create uh, opportunities in daily life for old and young to come together in ways that are mutually beneficial. Great. So Mark, we're starting to get some questions streaming in that I see. And one of them relates to something I wanted you to talk about more. So one of the uh, pan, uh, Participant said, one challenge I see, especially with more years in quote unquote retirement, is how do you afford to spend the time with younger generations? Can Mark speak about opportunities that also provide income? And I was actually gonna say, you, you made a passing reference to, the, to our own program, the Encore Fellowship, and I feel like that is part of the answer maybe. Absolutely. I, you know, I think there are many ways people can do this through volunteer programs, and, and I've seen some spectacular examples of that. There are ways that uh, people can do this in, informally in their neighborhoods, um, through local schools. But I think there's a huge and often overlooked opportunity for what at Encore we've been calling Encore careers that are focused on the next generation. The, the Now Teach program is a great example. Those are all people who are going into second acts in teaching that pay for schools in much the way that Teach for America teachers or other young people who are going through teaching fellowship programs are, are leading to, to a whole chapter in their paid working life and education, but it's hardly restricted to teaching. We, you know, we at Encore, um, as, as you uh, help uh, develop, Marcy, uh, found that four and a half million Americans over the age of 50 are in second acts focused for the greater good at the intersection of passion purpose and and to the to the uh, to the question that was asked a, a paycheck um, and 21 million more uh, people in this chapter in life say it's a top priority to to do the same but one of the questions that we've gotten from so many people just like the the, this we've just received here is, is how do you get from point A to point B, from what's last to what's next? And so we created the Encore Fellowships Program essentially to be a pathway to, to purpose, a way for people to get a line on the resume, to get exposed to, to a new work environment, but in ways that oftentimes drew heavily on their previous midlife skills. And so hit a balance between um, uh, new challenges, but also um, a building on existing strengths. And we've had a couple thousand Encore fellows already. Um, and uh, I think we need more experiential opportunities uh, to help people navigate this, this passage to, uh, to purpose and a paycheck. Can, yeah, can you talk a little bit more for people who don't know about what the Encore Fellowship, well, what the Encore Fellows are doing in the kinds of jobs they have and, and, the, and you, the interesting kind of other kind of mentorship that seems to come up? 
Yes. Uh, well, you know, it's funny because when we started the Encore Fellowship Program almost a decade ago, and uh, it's worth noting that, uh, that all 10 of the first fellowship placements were in youth organizations. Um, and it's also worth noting that at the end of the year, nine of the 10 Encore Fellows received job offers from the organization. And I think most of those organizations candidly would have said that they never would have considered somebody in their 50s, 60s, 70s for those roles uh, before they had an Encore Fellow. We realized that it became kind of a Trojan horse. And we were thinking of it from the fellow's perspective, getting an experience that could help them launch an Encore career. But from the organization's experience, it was an opportunity to try on a new kind of a new source of talent. And they liked it. Um, and that's been our experience ever since. But one of the reasons they liked it was not just because of what fellows bring in terms of skills like HR, IT, uh, marketing, uh, strategy, but also because so many of the fellows themselves became mentors for the executive director and other younger staff in the organization. That was never a formal part of the program, but just by creating this proximity um, and, and creating a role which wasn't uh, really a staff role in which the fellows who work half time, essentially a thousand hours a year, play and they weren't board members, even though many of them actually became board members of the organization afterwards, they became a sounding board and a source of support. And in fact, um, there's a brilliant illustration of that in popular culture, and it's the movie, The Intern. It's not a nonprofit setting, but the role that Robert De Niro plays in that movie uh, connecting with mentoring the young Anne Hathaway, CEO of the organization, is very similar to what we've seen throughout the Encore Fellows Program. And as an example of age integrating the workplace, which was another unanticipated benefit of the program and, and one that couldn't be more timely. Now, I'm kind of waiting for the reality TV series, which will feature our Encore Fellows as a follow-up to the interim. So, wow, we have a huge number of questions streaming in. So just give me a set a uh, uh, a second here. Here's a question. Um, is there an initiative in the making with Teach for America, just like now Teach in the UK? Do we know? Do you know, Mark? Well, you know, um, that's been something that that's been on our radar screen for a long time. Way back, almost a decade ago, uh, in the book Encore, I wrote about Paula Lopez Crespin, who uh, was a Teach for America member. Um, who uh, was different from uh, the rest of her peers in that she was 60. And she, like Lucy Kellaway, had been inspired by her daughter who had joined Teach for America. And she had an epiphany watching her daughter in the back of, uh, sitting in the back of, of her daughter's classroom. And she said, you know what, I'm gonna do that. So she applied to Teach for America, convinced she would never get accepted. And to her surprise, she got a, a letter saying, welcome. Uh, a month later, she was in a dorm room in Houston, Texas, in 110 degree heat, sharing a bathroom down the hall and rooming with three 22-year-olds. But she ended up staying with it and teaching in Denver at, a, at the Cole Academy for Arts and Sciences and then becoming a, a teacher in the Denver public school system. And so we went to Teach for America and um, worked with a brilliant young uh, Teach for America staff for Evan McKittrick and uh, did a webinar for people over 50 to join TFA. And in the end, uh, at that juncture, even though T TFA then, and I think still is really looking to, um, to bolster the ranks with non conventional uh, TFA members, the program itself is not as well suited for somebody entering the teaching profession at this juncture, just think of Paula Lopez Crespin in the, in the Houston dorm room, uh, sharing the bathroom down the hall. And I hope that we can come up with adaptations uh, here too that are, that are more, not just interested in older people, uh, but our, our, um, the program is, is adapted. And one great example, which was actually an inspiration for Now Teach, is the Encore Teacher Program created by Shari Lansing and Encore board member uh, in California um, that drew on Shuri's own experience. She was the first woman to lead a Hol Hollywood studio. She was the CEO of Paramount Pictures. But before that, she was a math teacher in the LA public schools and one of the founding board members of Teach for America. And the Encore Teacher Program 
is a spectacular example. It's just in California uh, right now, but I hope it'll, it will become national and really was an inspiration and a model for now teach. Right, and I, I always thought also that you know, someone should really work to rally retired teachers to support young teachers in the classroom. There's so many young teachers who are thrown into situations and need those mentors. So there's so many ideas that don't even have to involve becoming a full-time teacher, but supporting classrooms in other ways. And, you know, we, we know there are people trying to innovate in those spaces. Um, uh, in, fact, in Cleveland, the, as part of the Cleveland Encore Initiative, um, uh, experienced teachers and, and other older people have been serving as mentors for young Teach for America um, um, participants there. And I think there's, as you say, even in our experience core experience, the experience core members who themselves were not trained teachers, but in fact, many cases had never gone to college, um, have become consistently mentors for the teachers they're working with and, and a source of support um, and friendship in the classroom. Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, somebody's asked if we've, I know you're going to like this one, if we've seen any examples of policy um, or innovations at the state or government level that can help to facilitate an intergenerational society. You know, we're, we're right now in a period of, of policy quiescence here in the country. And I have to admit that, you know, when I came back from, um, from places like now teach as i mentioned was patterned in part on the encore teacher program here in the u.s or even the singapore program which was inspired by efforts in the u.s they made a, a trip to seattle to see the providence mount saint vincent nursing home assisted living facility there where 400 older residents uh live uh um, side by side with a preschool of 125 kids, uh, a preschool that has a two and a half year waiting list. It's an extraordinary program that I was just visiting a couple weeks ago. Um, so many of the efforts going on globally are actually based on great things that are happening here. And we have this wonderful efflorescence of creativity. In fact, one of my favorite stories, and I'll just digress really quickly, is uh, going to Cleveland in the middle of winter a couple of years ago to Judson Manor, uh, a retirement community right between the Cleveland Clinic and the Case Western Campus and all the cultural institutions in Cleveland, um, and going to see the Artisan Residence Program where, where this community has uh, about, uh, at that point, seven graduate music students from the conservatory in, in Cleveland living side by side with the older residents um, where there's proximity but and also common interest in the arts and music and where spectacular things have happened. Um, uh, one of the women that I met when I was there um, lived next door to a young violist who got married while she uh, or engaged while she was at Judson Manor and when they uh, she and her violist, young violist husband, uh, were planning their wedding. They asked uh, Carla, the 93-year-old neighbor, if she would be part of the wedding party. So, But when I showed up at Judson Manor, I was greeted by 25 Swedish social scientists who were coming to Cleveland in the middle of winter for ideas about social innovation. And so, you know, it's great to see so many people looking to the U.S. for these innovations and then going back to their countries and having 3.1, you know, $3 billion policy innovations, or I'm sure in Sweden, there'll be some great envious uh, effort at a national scale. And, you know, wondering why, uh, as we move to this moral than young society, uh, there's so little effort to scale what's out there, what's working, to understand what's working best, and to invest at the state level, at the, uh, at the federal level. Um, at the same time, there are some wonderful examples at the local level. Uh, in some cases, foundations which have tried to do comprehensive things like the Piper Trust in Maricopa County and Phoenix. And one of my favorites, which is San Jose, um, where Mayor Sam Licardo, who's a great innovator, wrote a campaign book before his first election in, in, that had contiguous chapters on the needs of young people and the potential contributions of older ones. Um, and that wasn't just left to to the pages of his campaign book, but since he took over as mayor of San Jose, he's led a major gen-to-gen -gen effort there uh, that includes um, in Santa Clara County, where San Jose is located, a spectacular effort at the uh, local first five early childhood 
initiative where all 27 family resource centers in, in Santa Clara County are integrating older people as part of their work and, and volunteer force, mostly Latino grandmothers who are dropping off their grandchildren in the morning and who've been invited in and received training and have become uh, a central part of the fabric of the preschool workforce in those places. And so yeah, it's not hard to imagine at a time where at the state level, for example, in California, the governor has put expansion of early childhood education at the top of his policy list and spending billions, but even nationally where there's rare agreement among conservatives and, and liberals, Democrats and Republicans around the importance of early education uh, and a big work, workforce question that goes with it, how we could start developing policies to, to engage older people and go from there and, and, and think of other opportunities as well. So I have two, we have two questions here that are kind of uh, in the same neighborhood. One is uh, what's going on in faith communities? And the other is, do you find people of all generations need and want personal and meaningful ceremonies and rituals that can help guide them as part of mentoring or community support to mark the pivotal life cycle events? Many over 50s are all over the world are certified life cycle celebrants, pers personalized ritual makers, a worldwide movement. Are you familiar? I, I, I am vaguely familiar and, and I wish I was far more uh, um, knowledgeable about that particular effort, but I, I've really been uh, so moved by what's happening uh, in faith communities and what's possible. In fact, just this past Friday, I got to visit a Gen to Gen Encore Prize finalist from uh, 2018, which is a, a group called Nuns and Nuns, uh, which began almost informally, organically, um, where groups of uh, women religious nuns um, uh, and millennials who uh, uh, notoriously as a generation uh, check none when it comes to religious affiliation in surveys and yet also show high levels of spiritual orientation. <laughs> so behind this brilliant title of Nuns and Nuns are uh, meetups that have been happening all around the country by particularly involving young people who are interested in, in changing the world, wanting to connect with older people, older women who have spent their whole life in service trying to leave the world better than they found it, and um, finding kind of a deep emotional support at a time where you know the national environment is not that supportive of that kind of work. And now they've launched a residency at the Mercy Center in Burlingame near the San Francisco airport, a beautiful 40-acre facility where uh, uh, a half dozen millennial nuns are getting together with a similar sized group of, uh, of older uh, sisters um, to think about how they can develop projects and work together to uh, create positive change. And when I visited, I was struck by this 40 acre Mercy Center. By the way, the Sisters of Mercy are the ones who are behind the Mercy Corps as well, which does remarkable uh, relief work around the globe, but there's a preschool on, on the Mercy Center campus, there's a high school, there's a nursing home. It, it's a, an intergenerational utopia uh, in, uh, encased in a uh, faith environment. Um, you know, that's a very utopian kind of example, but I think, uh, you know, a sense of what could be possible and the role faith could, could play. Great. We have more questions here, Mark. Um, can you please comment about what type of support is available for older or retired people who, to prepare for a transition, to find and prepare for the best way that they can help young people? Mm. You know, well, one, one thing that's um, uh, really heartening is how many great books that are coming out these days about how, how to grow older in a way that's not about self-indulgence um, and that puts purpose at its center. There's uh, Mary Pfeiffer's new uh, book, Women Rowing North, um, uh, Jonathan Rausch's great book, uh, uh, The Happiness Curve, uh, uh, Barb Haggerty's uh, Life Reimagined. Um, but beyond the, the books and the, this wisdom that is now available, uh, and that's just a, a few of the great 
uh, um, books that are out now. Um, um, there's the Gen to Gen campaign, and, and this is a uh, an unpaid, uh, uh, shameless promotional <laughs> pitch. But as we were talking earlier, uh, that this campaign to mobilize a million older people to help young people thrive um, is is a call to action. But it's also um, um, uh, a pathway and a source of support for people who want to who want to go from aspiration to action. Um, if anybody uh, has the chance, is interested, has the chance to go to the Generation to Generation website, they'll find tools and resources there. They'll find opportunities with over 200 partner organizations, which include most of the major youth organizations in the country. And they'll uh, also find stories of peers who uh, have taken uh, this route um, and in an unexpurgated way are telling about what it's really like beyond just the uh, the glory, what it, what it means at, at this juncture in life to, uh, to become engaged in youth organizations and with young people. So uh, getting to some more practical things, we mentioned a lot of, you've been talking a lot about nonprofit work and the youth organizations we partner with. What are some of the challenges, this is a question here, what are some of the challenges where nonprofits aren't really ready to scale up or they're uh, using, using paid staff is cost prohibitive? Um, how, how, can, how can people kind of find the right volunteer opportunities? And I think the answer is gonna be, right, that is kind of the sweet spot of what we're trying to do at Agenda Gen, right, curate some of those. But you've been around a lot of nonprofits. Like, what's your take on kind of how to know if a program is a good one to get involved with? And then also, how to be a good mentor, which you've studied quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I don't want to be a Pollyanna, but I think things have really gotten much better um, uh, in the nonprofit sector. And while the sector isn't fully prepared for the talent of the older population and isn't in an overall way, um, you know, enthusiastically embracing what we have to contribute, I think there's much greater receptivity than there's ever been before. And I think in part, it's be, it's been a result of the resource squeezes that many not Profits have faced um, and, and the need to be creative about finding uh, unconventional sources of talent. Um, I think also in the nonprofit sector, there's been um, much more awareness of, of the importance of, of human resources. Um, and I think that's really added to receptivity. Um, I think back, you know, when I wrote my first book about these issues, Primetime, I told the story of a wonderful woman who's since passed on, Thea, Thea Glass, who was uh, uh, a physician and a pioneer in women's medicine, ran one of the main rehabilitation clinics uh, in Philadelphia, retired in her 60s uh, with a nest egg to Florida and quickly was bored. And so she presented herself to the local hospital. Um, there's this woman, you know, who had been a leader in the medical profession, and they were so happy that she wanted to help them out, and they offered her a job refilling water pitchers. <laughs> to her, uh, Fortune wrote an article about her story with the title, uh, Candy Striper My Ass. I don't know if you can say like that on, on webinars, but um, that, you know, this all dressed up with few receptive places to go was the norm back then. I don't think it's the norm now. Um, I, I think that um, um, there are many more opportunities and even the response to the Gen to Gen campaign on the part of organizations. I was mentioning 200 organizations, all the brand names in, um, in the mentoring field and the youth development field are part of the campaign from Girls Inc. through Big Brothers Big Sisters through Boys and Girls Clubs. So I think this is, is a good time and yet still um, you know what I hear from people who are taking uh, this step is that it's a little bit like the role women played uh, in the workplace a generation back where there wasn't an engraved invitation and a red carpet being rolled at that it was by sheer force of will that that they were crafting these new roles and also in a great form of legacy making it easier for the next generation of, of older people to to contribute in this way so i i think that that there's greater re receptivity but there's also a lot of work we can do ourselves um, to make it easier for those coming behind us to make significant contributions 
So Mark, one, one big change it seems in this chapter of the work of, of Encore and maybe even of the audience that you're connecting with and I know speaking with on this tour, there seem to be a lot more younger people connecting with these ideas. You've spoken with Courtney Martin in public. You're in New York, you're gonna speak with Marco Salazar who's like a social change millennial uh, kind of voice. Uh, why do you think younger people are starting to pay attention to these issues? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's an incredibly positive sign. And it's not just in this area, but even in, in other areas focused on age, like the end of life uh, movement that's underway, the caregiving movement. There's so many young people and young innovators who are engaged in this work. Even the Now Teach example that I gave, uh, Lucy Kellaway created Now Teach not alone, but with a 28-year-old remarkable social innovator doctorate in education named um, Katie Waldengrave, who brought enormous expertise. And it's a beautiful example of how the generations can come together to create a powerful solution. And I've, I've seen it over and over again in our own work, um, this idea of generations with generations of younger and older people bringing their unique assets in ways that create something that no person could create on their own. And then you have young people who, uh, you know, on their own are doing great things. One of our favorite examples at Encore is Nesterly, which was created by two women in their 20s, recent graduates of MIT City Planning Program, to help uh, pair older people who have uh, extra room and need uh, help with chores and young graduate students who are in need of reduced rent in expensive places like Boston um, and in ways that not only are efficient but but create the seeds for cross-generational relationships and so I'm, I'm really heartened by the movement of so many young people and I, I guess in a way having been one of these 20 somethings who was really interested in older people and you know i think i started working on experience core when i had just crossed into my 30s um it uh it feels uh familiar too because i see when i talk to them young people who recognize that they themselves will soon be older people but even more than that have a kind of real appreciation um of the wisdom of age and and what older people can contribute so Mark, do you think this intergenerational connection that you're talking about might uh, be one of the ways we could combat ageism? Absolutely. You know, I, I think that one of the, you know, one of the grievous wounds of, of radical age segregation has been the, the uh, uh, pernicious um, spread of, of ageism. You know, if, you, if we divide life up in these unnatural ways and people don't have a sense of the wholeness of life, you're going to harbor stereotypes um, and a sense of wariness. Uh, it turns out that research shows that older and younger people are about as, as segregated as, as Caucasians and Latinos in American society. Um, and yet this, this type of segregation is not even seen as, as something that's unnatural and uh, unhealthy. Um, it's just seen as, as, you know, the way things are. But in fact, it's something that we created. We created recently. Um, we created out of a, a false sense of, of efficiency and that we need to, as I was saying earlier, undo. And I think one of the great benefits will be less loneliness and social isolation in society, less of a sense of conflict, and also less ageism because um, I, I think... Uh, we'll have a, a, a greater appreciation of, of what we, we each bring. Yeah. So I just want to uh, circle back to at the beginning. I mentioned that you were covered in the New York Times yesterday in a column by Jane Brody about mentoring. And I'd just love to talk a little bit about, I think you had some counterintuitive ideas about what makes a good mentor from all of the, the studying you've been doing and uh, what does make a good mentor? Well, uh, you know, I know it's not, it's not politically correct to quote Woody Allen <laughs> these days, but I, I can't help because, you know, he has that great line about 90% of success in life is showing up and probably 98% of success in mentoring is, is showing up. Um, you know, we have this image that, you know, mentors are supposed to be like Robert De Niro in the, uh, um, uh, in the intern or, or uh, Sylvester Stallone in, in Creed, these, you know, charismatic movie actor types. But it, in fact, the biggest thing that we can do as mentors is, is to 
to be there. Um, and I think, you know, older people need to spend less time trying to be young and more time trying to be there for young people. And that's the key to, to good mentoring. We found um, in the Big Brother, Big Sister study all those decades ago that, that the mentors who showed up regularly, uh, who were persistent, um, were the ones who were tied to success and the ones who came in imparting lots of advice and, you know, the McKinsey-like plan for transforming the life of young people were dismal failures. In fact, young people in those relationships were actually hiding from their mentors. <laughs> Only 9% were actually meeting after nine, nine months. And, and that gets to the sort of the second point, which is something that I talked with Jane Brody about, and I'm so glad that she included in the article, which is, um, it's much more important um, uh, along with showing up uh, to shut up. <laughs> you know, that seems rather extreme, but the more positive take is, is that listening is, is absolutely critical. Um, young people want uh, people who are tuned into them, who are paying attention, who are listening far more than imparters of advice and, and um, instruction for, you know, how they can turn their, their life around. Um, so I think that, and, and it reminds me of something that I learned from one of my uh, great mentors, John Gardner, who was our founding board member at Encore and who uh, was Lyndon Johnson, Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, um, founded Common Cause. He, he said that one of the things he had learned in life is that it was much more important to be interested than it is to be interesting. And that certainly can be said for mentoring. Mm. You, you are both of those things, Mark. I, I think we have time for uh, a couple of more questions. So if, are, if you're okay, I'm going to throw them at you. What role do you think colleges and universities can play in connecting the generations? I know you have thoughts on this one. Well, I, I, uh, I'm so impressed with the movement in higher education now, which uh, is creating what Rosabeth Moss Cantor, the former editor of, of Harvard Business Review, uh, a, professor at Harvard Business School um, calls the third stage of education. And, and Cantor has uh, led the way in creating the Advanced Leadership uh, Institute at Harvard where people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s come back and spend a year uh, at, in school. Uh, Stanford's uh, done something similar that has a strong wellness focus called the Distinguished Careers Institute. And uh, another one of our board members at Encore, um, uh, Phyllis Moen, has created a much more affordable version of, of this third state of education at the University of Minnesota. Um, and they're part of a growing group that includes the Union Theological Seminary, Notre Dame, the University of Texas, Oxford now. Um, of education programs that are helping people, just like the Encore Fellows Program helps people in an experiential way um, to, to get from what's last to what's next. But one of the important benefits of these efforts is age integrating universities, which are arguably our most age segregated institution. And it's been really enlightening to be in classes from Stanford to the University of Minnesota that are comprised jointly of older and, and younger people and to see what they're learning from each other. There's a, a student at the University of Minnesota, a young woman who famously, uh, and this, she was quoted in the Wall Street Journal, said, you know, she couldn't understand why there were all these old people in her future of work class until she realized that they had actually worked. So, <laughs> Um, so I, I think that there's so much more that we can do in, in higher education, but I, I'm heartened by, by this movement and other developments that are underway. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, Mark, you and I have been invited to speak at universities for a long time now, often to reunions and retirement groups, but I think increasingly getting people of all generations to be thinking about learning together is is what we'd like to see more kind of you know not creating some new segregated ways that just older people are learning separate from younger people but that we all you know our, our friend Ken Dayquad has this beautiful idea that, that um, college should come with a subscription and when you graduate you just have a lifelong membership and keep going back and I think that would bring the generations together really nicely you know, one radical idea for doing that, uh, our colleague at Encore, Jim Emmerman, and Deb Whitman, who's the head of pu public policy at AARP, together we, we put together a, a paper uh, two years ago 
with the idea that older people could take an early year of social security um, to pay for a, higher, a year of higher education, and then they would work an actuarially adjusted period later, so it would be cost neutral to the, to the program, but it would become kind of like the GI Bill uh, in the sense that that's returning soldiers had brought with this voucher that then changed higher education because there were so many people with all this money to spend in higher education adapted. What if, if every one of us over the age of 50 um, had this opportunity to spend a year of social security on additional education in return for uh, working uh, that same period longer before qualifying uh, for regular social security benefits. So I think we need to be having a debate about um, how we could make this happen on a much more widespread basis. It would help people launch encore careers and other new chapters, but it would also age in a great higher education writ large. Mark, we're, we're approaching the end time here. Um, uh, and someone just asked, will we be able to watch this webinar again? And the answer is yes, we've recorded this webinar and we're, we've been asked if there will be links provided. So we will be sharing as much as we can capture of what um, uh, the many, many resources that Mark mentioned here, we can include in the follow-up email you get. But there's also gonna be a slide at the end of your screen with a few actions you can all take at the end of this webinar. And uh, uh, we hope that everyone, we're assuming most of you are on the Encore and Gen to Gen mailing list already. It's a great way to keep up with other ideas. We trust you've already ordered or read Mark's book. And if so, we'd appreciate reviews on Amazon and other places where you re read reviews. This is the beauty of Mark. Positive. <laughs> I trust only positive reviews. Um, and we, we, you know, obviously there's a lot of interest in this intergenerational a new way of living. And I think if you join the Gen to Gen campaign, um, we promise not to bother you too much, but we will provide you with lots of resources and ways to connect with each other and, um, and find opportunities to live in the ways that Mark's been talking about. So uh, it's been a real pleasure talking, Mark. We haven't been able to do this for a long time, so it was a thrill for me. Likewise. Thanks so much, Marcy. And thanks to everybody for taking an hour to spend uh, as part of the webinar.